I'm excited. Woo! My name is Samantha Deal. Welcome to my channel. Uh, this is Realizing Research, where I talk to you about primary scientific literature. What am I talking about today? Hox genes, baby. Hox genes literally pattern us from head to our toes, from our armpit to our hand, from our thumb to our pinky. And they act while we're actually developing, like, you know, inside your mama, exactly where a Hox gene is expressed will define what that region will become. What do I mean by that? I mean that the Hox genes that come on wherever your eyeballs are, are different from the Hox genes that come on wherever your mouth are and wherever your chest is and wherever your abdomen is and so on and so on. If Hox genes that are wherever your mouth is came on where your eyeballs were, then you would have a mouth for eyeballs. What I'm talking about today is specifically Hox genes within vertebrates. Those of us with a spine, you know. I will have a link in case you want to read this paper on your own. It is open access. If you have any questions whatsoever, please post them in the comments. You can also email me. I plan on posting a follow-up video where I address any questions you have. The last author in the paper usually tells you what lab the paper com came from. And the last author in this paper is Denis de Boulay. Denita Boule is a scientist who has his own Wikipedia page. That's like you made it. And he's been studying mammalian Hox genes almost as long as I've been alive. This lab is devoted to that. So this paper is called The Constrained Architecture of Hox Genes. What does that mean? It literally means Hox genes are tight, yo. That's not very helpful. I mean that if you compare one of the best studied um, set of Hox genes within the fruit fly, this is where they're first discovered. What you find is that they're pretty spread out and in some cases you actually have a split. But within mammals, it's actually siphoned down. They have literally cut out everything in the middle. The first thing I want to address is what is a gene? You guys have all heard of genes, I'm sure of that. Probably you've seen some sort of cell where they show you a dividing cell and all of your chromosomes are aligned in the middle in this beautiful orientation. That only happens when the cell is dividing. What genes look like normally is if you take those metaphase DNA and you just unravel it and it just turns into a bowl of spaghetti within the nucleus, except for the exact organization of this bowl of spaghetti is actually pretty important. If we dive in further, you can depict what I'm calling genes on a string. Those genes, those acting units, are within that DNA, surrounded by what you can think of as extra regions, they're regulatory regions, they're very important, but the genes, again, are the acting units. But essentially, a gene is an acting element or unit of DNA. Now, a gene will typically turn from DNA into RNA into protein, but that's not very critical for this paper. They're mostly interested in what's going on within the DNA itself. When is it becoming expressed? AKA, when is the DNA turning into RNA? So first thing you, should, you need to know about Hox genes is they are collinear. What does that mean? That means if you look at our genes on a string, this time I've just numbered them as one through five, what you'll find is that where Hox gene one is expressed within this region. And then Hox gene two, which is actually a little further down in the DNA, is actually in this region. Hox gene three, four, and so on and so on. Orientation of those Hox genes on the DNA strand reflects what the orientation is throughout the body axis. And this is very unique. Most of the time, genes that are in the same pathway or act similarly are definitely not in the same region of DNA. And it suggests that there's a purpose to them being in this orientation. So the next thing you need to know is that Hox genes pattern like every animal you can think of. I'm talking dogs, I'm talking whales, I'm talking flies, bees, platypus, mice, lobsters. I mean, if you can think of it, they have Hox genes and they use them to pattern themselves. If you look at Hox genes throughout a bunch of different species, which I'm showing you here, you can see that most species have what we call orthologs or genes that are similar in structure and action across species. But vertebrates are unique. 
I mean, we still have collinear Hox genes and we still have Hox genes that pattern us head to toe along every axis pretty much. What's different about us is timing actually matters. So I'm showing a video here of the chick development. And the unique thing about studying chicks is you can actually just open the little egg and put a camera inside and see the process of development. So here, what you're looking at is the development of the part of the head and the spine. If you follow the spinal structures forming, you have development of the early spinal structures come before the later spinal stru structures. And that's because Hox genes one, two, three come on before Hox genes 11, 12, 13. All vertebrates do it this way. Everything that has a spine does it this way. Timing matters. And it's thought that this, this tightening of the mammalian Hox genes is what is important for regulating that timing of patterning. Maybe you're imagining what happens when you replicate DNA. You're like, okay, well, that's fine. You just turn on, you just read through one and then the others are gonna come on later if you keep reading through. This is not really how things are done in biology. The read through is relatively fast um, and you want to make multiple copies. So you actually wanna read through over and over and over again. There must be something within that unit that is actually controlling the timing. So in order to address how timing might be regulated, what they did is they decided to actually just invert some regions of this DNA. So they start by just inverting single genes, Hox gene 11 and Hox gene 12, and then they go on to invert two genes at a time, Hox gene 11 and 12. So let's introduce you to the cluster of Hox genes that they talk about this in this paper. This again is a gene on a string and they're focusing on Hox gene 10, 11, 12, and 13. They chose to study these ones because it's an easier time point to actually look at the expression. Let's move on and actually talk about their data. So first I want to familiarize you guys with what some of the data looks like. And this is a whole animal in situ hybridization. What is that? That is where you take a tiny probe, which recognizes a specific sequence. In this case, it's the RNA sequence for a Hox genes 11, 12, and 10. <laughs> then this probe actually has a chemical um, attached to it. And that chemical allows you to perform a chemical reaction, which leads to colorization of this embryo. While this isn't really good for quantifying the level of RNA, it can tell you where that RNA is expressed. So within this embryo, you can see that 12 seems to come on pretty far down the tail region. 11 comes on a little bit earlier and 10 seems to come on earlier than that. And this is pretty standard. You can also see that it does seem to come on within the limbs, um, which is not shocking. Uh, the Hox genes, as I mentioned, also structure your limbs. Now we're gonna take that gene region and we're gonna flip it around. They flip just one to start with. And when you look at the inversion of Hox gene 11 or the flipping, what you see is Hox gene 12 is really, really far down from where it used to be expressed, if it's expressed very much at all. Hox 11 uh, looks about the same and Hox 10 is about the same. This tells you that there seems to be a difference in the area where it's expressed. You really want to quantify the total of amount of RNA. And they do this through RNA sequencing where you sequence the RNA and you can count the number of sequencing reads and this will tell you the amount of RNA. It's a bar graph where they count the number of RNAs within the kidney um, for each Hox gene. So they start with a gene that is upstream of Hox gene 13, and then they count uh, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. And all of the normal levels are in gray. And when the, they inverted Hox gene 11, you see that in orange. So you first see that Hox gene 12 is severely reduced. Um, you also see that Hox gene 11 is, seems to be upregulated. They wanted to know why this happens. And in order to explain that, I first need to explain a couple of things about DNA. Two things that are really important. First, the orientation in which you read DNA is critical. And second, in order for DNA to be read, it needs to have the proper signals. I need to tell you, first of all, DNA is made up of nucleotides, and there are only four of them, A, T, C, G. So nucleotides A, T, C, G 
make up the entire regions of DNA. So in order to get across what I'm explaining, I'm going to make up a gene called GAT cat. That's right, GAT cat, cat with a GAT. That has a specific uh, meaning to you, <laughs> a cat with a pistol. Possibly the scariest thing I've ever heard of. So what happens if we take GAT cat and we read it in the opposite orientation? What that turns into is T-A-C-T-A-G, tac tag. While that sounds like a scary rendition of a children's game, it doesn't have anywhere near the same meaning as our GAT cat. So if you look at the opposite strand of GAT cat, could you get the same meaning? For every strand of DNA, there is an opposite strand which is bound to it. Um, if you look at the opposite strand, it's actually the other binding nucleotide. So for G, it only binds to C and A only binds to T. That would be CTA, GTA. The only thing I could come up with for CTA was Chicago Transit Authority and then GTA could be Grand Theft Auto. Now, while buses within Grand Theft Auto may be an expansion pack, it definitely doesn't, again, have the same meaning as Gat Cat. So, the orientation that you read it in and the strand that you read it on is really important. So the next thing I wanna note is the signals. So in order to get that across, I wanna introduce you to Polly. Polly's long name is polymerase too, but that's not very fun, so we're gonna call her Polly. Polly is a very special enzyme that has the capacity to read and write DNA into RNA. The issue with Polly is she doesn't know where she's going. So she needs to have specific targets in order to bind to DNA. As she's floating around, riding around, uh, she finds a target site. And the, she's like, oh, target site, she's gonna bind to it, except for it seems that there's a bunch of DNA actually bound up in that area. So Polly can't really land on that target site. So she's gonna keep going. Then she carries on and she finds another gene. And this time there is a target and no bound up DNA, but there are a bunch of negative signals there that are like, we don't want you here, Polly. We don't like you, you're not our type. So Polly says, Ooh, maybe not. So then she looks for another gene. She finds another target. What happens, and if that target has all the signals that tell her, yes, please write me into RNA, then that's exactly what Polly does. She reads that DNA and writes it into RNA. And that's fantastic, great. But I should note one more thing that could happen. She can actually land on a gene and sometimes get confused. Maybe she doesn't have the exact right signals. She could read in the opposite orientation or she can jump onto the other strand and read that strand. And this is not what you want. It's not gonna give you anything useful. But if she reads the opposite strand, this is called the antisense RNA. Two things, very important. DNA needs to be read in the right orientation and it needs to have the proper signals. So let's see what they found within their inverted DNA. So again, what they're showing you is actually genes on a string, and this is the RNA sequencing data from that. So you're counting the number of RNA, or the amount of gene expression, pretty much. And this is quantified as little bars. So you can see where Hox gene 11 is, you have a lot of RNA expressed within the kidneys. And Hox gene 13 is completely absent. Thir 12 seems to have some level, and 10 also has some level of expression. They also note that there is what we call runoff, and that's that little arrow where you can see DNA that actually gets made beyond Hox gene 11. And this means Polly didn't really have the right get off signals at the end of Hox gene 11, so she kept reading sometimes. Okay, so what happens when you invert 11? What you see here is a bunch of red peaks, and that's actually antisense Hox gene 11. So that means that Polly got lost. It's like when she bound to that, bound to that gene and then she didn't know which orientation to go in. Um, so then she ended up going in the opposite orientation or hopping on the opposite chromosome, that sort of thing. 
What's more is when Polly read Hoxgene 11 in the opposite orientation, she created a traffic jam. Hoxgene 12 Polly was like, I'm gonna keep reading. And then she ran into Hoxgene 11 Polly who was going in the wrong orientation and Hoxgene 12 didn't really get made to the proper levels. This is kind of interesting. Um, but it doesn't really tell you about how they're regulating timing for Hox genes, right? I told you that they did flip Hox gene 12 around, but they didn't find anything really, really fascinating with regards to how they're actually regulating the timing of gene expression. That's when they flip two genes around. In this case, we have both Hox gene 11 and Hox gene 12, and there was also what's called a DNA insulator that was right outside of Hox gene 12 that they took, and they flipped that around. So what happens when they did that? If we go back to our in-situ hybridization, our embryos, and we look at expression, um, in this case, we're looking at 13 and 11, and uh, 13 seems to have expanded up much higher and 11 looks to be maybe a little bit higher, but pretty much in the same location. And in fact, if you look at the kidneys, while you're normally not supposed to have Hox gene 13 expression, you have that when you invert it. What is actually happening here? I mentioned that they flipped that insulator when they flipped Hox G 11 and 12, right? What does that insulator do? I mentioned that you could have negative signals around a gene and poly can't bind, and you can have positive signals around a gene and poly can bind, and she actually leads to reading and writing of DNA. Those insulators keep those signals locked apart. So on the opposite side of this insulator, you would have in the kidneys shutdown of Hox gene 13, right? And on the other side, you would have positive signals that tell you to express. Insulators are commonly referred to as CTCF sites, and that's just based on the DNA sequence that's present there. So they bind to one another and they lock in those signals. And you don't have spreading really of those positive or negative signals. But if you actually get rid of one of those insulators, you have spreading of positive signals into the area where they're not supposed to be and some of the negative signals into the other area. So if they look at the data for this, if they quantify those negative and positive signals, what you see is this. You have the orange peak to finding your negative signals that are telling Polly to get out of here, and you have those positive signals in green, which are telling Polly to, hey, come on, go ahead and make us into RNA. The insulator is that dotted line running straight up through the middle. So those orange peaks are right over Hox gene 13, right? And the green peaks seem to be locked into 11 and 10 and a little bit on 12. And they don't seem to really spread. What happens when you flip that thing around and remove that insulator? What you have now is those green signals are spreading from where Hox gene 11 and 12 and 10 are into 13. And this leads to expression of 13. Now, this is a potential mechanism of regulating timing. Maybe those insulators are actually controlling when the genes are expressed, or at least locking them in afterwards. You have these DNA insulators that seem to be regulating exactly when Hox gene 13 comes on. But does that actually have an impact? So what they do is they look at kidneys. Um, and what happens when you have elevated level of Hox gene 13 within kidneys? Now I'm not used to looking at kidneys, but I can tell you the one on the right, if the one on the right is normal, which it is, the one on the left seems to have massive holes in it. And there seem to also be some dark spots which are dead cells. So the last thing that I like to talk about is the significance. Why does it matter? Why do you care? Why do I care? First of all, if I told you that every single mammalian system uses Hox genes and they're all tight like this, that means that this method for controlling the timing of expression is likely to be used in every species that has this makeup. That is a lot. In addition, where you're talking about a cluster of genes that seems to be regulated as a group. If you find other genes that seem to act as a group and have a timing effect, you would start to say, okay, is it possible that they're doing this through insulators, like is what is happening here? The next thing is that these domains of DNA are relatively new, and we don't always understand when they have a consequence and when they don't. 
So this is really helpful in understanding that. The last thing is that you should always keep in mind that this could have implications. So if a patient comes in, for example, and you end up sequencing them and find that there is some sort of dysregulation of Hox gene 13, you would then know to look out for potential kidney issues, for example. I hope you guys enjoyed the paper. If you like this, please come back, please subscribe, please like this video, all of those things, of course. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Fantastic. Let me go ahead and take some coffee real quick. From head to toe. Um, head to toe, head to toe, wherever our toes are. Um, yeah.